Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Turnbull and we'll be talking about quite a few things today. So let's do a quick overview of what we'll be covering. We'll be covering OSHA, some of its history, some of the guidelines and standards that it sets for dental offices, what some of its jurisdictions are. We'll also be talking about the impact of OSHA. So that has a lot of interesting facts in it, and we'll definitely be going over those numbers. We'll be talking about OSHA in the state of Florida. Are we an OSHA-approved state program? And how many are an OSHA-approved state programs? How many out there? Who is not covered under OSHA? Those are some things that some people may not know about. Some employers must, what they, what they must provide, what they must not provide some protocols, some, some uh, procedures. Next we got the, we'll be talking about the CDC. And so that stands for the Center for Disease Control. We'll be talking about their history, some of the things they do. We'll be talking about a big part of our portion of what we'll be talking about today is exposure control plan. And we'll go more in detail into that. We'll of course be talking about COVID-19 which has taken up a lot of headlines in 2020, and we'll go over some, some key aspects of, of the COVID. We'll be talking about standard and universal precautions. So more information on that, that topic. So something that I'm, I'm big on and something that we'll, we'll be, uh, definitely be discussing more in detail is prevention methods, especially PPE, which stands for proper protective equipment. We'll go over in gloves, hand washing, masks, all that stuff. We'll be talking about waste disposal. Some things that we'll, 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 we'll go into as sharps, the containers, stuff like that. Labels, color coding. We'll be talking about dental office waste. Some non-regulated, regulated. Some of those things that cover what goes into that. And what you need to do when you, when you have stuff, especially regulated waste. We'll be talking about sharps containers specifically. Kind of give you an idea of what you need to do when you have those those stuff and how to dispose properly dispose of it. We're we'll talking about housekeeping and laundering practices, training requirements, what, how often, who needs to be trained, and who does the training. Those are some things we will be discussing. Record keeping, how long? What needs to be included in that record keeping? We'll have a, a big part of the chain of infection and how they spread and uh, the mechanisms. We'll also be talking about modes of transmission, disease transmission. We'll have at the end, we'll have a question and answers uh, slash scenarios. We'll go into some of uh, we'll cover some things that we talk about and then uh, we'll figure out what, what's the, the right way to, to answer these questions and if we have certain scenarios, how, how, to, how to do the right thing. We'll be covering all that stuff. All right, so let's go back up to the top and let's get into it. So we have OSHA and there's the logo right there. It stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It was passed in 1970, and I think it was enacted and actually put into, into effect in 1971. President Richard Nixon is the one that gets the credit for, for the act. So it ensures safety and healthful, healthful working conditions. OSHA's mission is enforce the standards by providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. Part of the United States Department of Labor, and it is a regulatory agency. The impact of OSHA. So we got some we got some interesting facts. We got some numbers to throw out there for you, and we'll be talking about. And these numbers will show some of the big impact that OSHA has had. It's it's a it's been a really good thing for for workers, especially when the the jurisdiction falls under OSHA. So let's go right into the numbers. So in 1970, an estimated 14,000 workers were killed on the job. So you can see there was quite a big problem and it, something needed to be done. So that comes out to be 38 people dead per day. 50 years later, or about 50 years later, in 2018, 
And these numbers are coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I found this on the website of OSHA.gov. In 2018, reports were just over 5,000 were killed that year, 14 per day. So we went from 14,000 deaths per year in 1970 all the way down to just above 5,000 in 2018. And that is on top of U.S. employment, which doubled to over 146 million. So we saw the workforce double and grow quite a bit. And we saw injuries and deaths go down quite a bit. So you're starting to see the impact and the importance of OSHA and some of the, the standards that they have set, some of the guidelines that need to be followed. And this is why we're talking about this today. Kind of give you a broader idea and some specifics and what we could do to keep patients, dental team, and the community safe. Let's go a little bit more into the numbers. So injuries in 1972 were about 11% for the workforce. So again, pretty, pretty staggering. And then injuries in 2018 were just, a little, just below 3%. So we really see some improvements there. All right, so let's go on to OSHA in the state of Florida. Under federal OSHA jurisdiction, covers most private sectors within the state. This is one that I saw was pretty common. OSHA does not usually cover, or if any of the 50 states, state and local government workers are not covered by federal OSHA. I believe part of that could be that they don't want to be sued. Just like the military, you can't sue the military. So it's, it's interesting how no, no state government agencies are covered under it. Now, Florida is not one of the 22 states with an OSHA approved state program. And that that's pretty that's pretty common within I noticed the southern states and the the Midwest the, the central areas it seemed like the North was was heavily uh, was they were usually the ones that were OSHA approved state programs such as New York who is not covered under OSHA some things you may not know a self employed family members of farm employees other federal agencies for example the Department of Injury. Uh, energy and the Coast Guard. So some, some things that employers must do. So they must inform workers about chemical hazards and that's why we label them and give information in case of, 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 of these hazards happening within the workplace. Provide safety training. We'll be talking about initial training, annual training, how often you need to do it. Keeping accurate records of work-related injuries such as names, dates, numbers and how often and how many years you need to keep those records uh, in the books perform tests in the workplace provide required ppe such as surgical gloves at no cost also some things that may not be noted or may not be known as well is you must notify osha within eight hours of fatality notify osha within 24 hours of inpatient hospitalization amputation or loss of an eye. I've also provided the number where if these emergencies occur where you would need to call and any questions could be uh, could be answered there as well. Next we have the CDC. We'll be going a little bit of their history, not too much, but we'll talk a little bit about them. CDC stands for the Center for Disease Control. And what's, uh, what's kind of cool is that I've been by the building quite a few times. It's a cool building. I grew up in Atlanta, so that's, that's a well-known building there. Started in 1946, like I mentioned, in Atlanta. One of the major component, components of Department of Health. Its mission is works 24-7 to protect America from health, safety, and security threats. Fights disease and supports communities. It's a non-regulatory agency. Now let's go into a big part of our topic, and that is exposure control plan. This helps with things like infection control. These are some things that the, is required by OSHA. CDC helps, uh, they talk about some of this stuff and what, and what can be done as well. We'll be going into general, general policies. Every office must have one, every dental office must have a written out plan. Describes how office complies with BBP, which is bloodborne pathogen standards. All right, before we go more in depth with the exposure control plan, 
Let's go over some of the COVID-19 prevention. That seems to have ruled the day right now and it's changed a lot of things. We're kind of out of the norm this year and a lot of things have changed. Some dental offices had to shut down for a little while. And see here, these are some of the things that are some of the guidelines and some of the things that you can do to keep patients, the dental team, and the community safe. And that's one of the most important things. We want to save lives and also help with, with dental, dental issues. So one of the first things that we can do is uh, pretty simple. Do temperature checks at the door. And usually they, so you have maybe like an area where you could do it right at the door, right before they come in would be pref uh, preferable. And let's see what's going on. Give them a little temperature check. Are, are they normal? Are they, do they have a high temperature? If they have a high temperature, you know, probably be safe to have them come back on another day. Also, after you do a temperature, they may check out, but you're going to want to ask them some questions. So some, some simple questions that, that you could ask them, like a, a questionnaire, would be, do you have COVID-19? Have you been in contact with someone that has COVID-19? Have you been around someone that's been asked to quarantine or have you been asked to quarantine? So those are some simple questions that can, that can, be, that can be asked, again, to, to keep that safety. Now, a big rule has been that six foot social distance. So a lot of offices probably had to rearrange their waiting room areas, move some furniture around, maybe totally take out the furniture. Or, or So for example, in one video, I follow a YouTuber, she's a dental assistant named Jennifer Sadinsky. They were doing, they were showing some TikTok videos and one of the TikTok videos there was so they were showing the waiting room and they moved all the furniture to near the front desk to kind of tell patients you know let's follow the six foot rule and still you'd have patients come on come there and then they would literally drag the chair out from under the desk and then sit there so <laughs> i thought that was funny and interesting and some of the things that could go on at a dental office and that people yeah especially in a professional setting we need to take these things seriously I know everybody has maybe different opinions on certain things and how we should go about it, but it's, it's always good to maintain that professional standard and follow guidelines. And we need to hold, we need to hold ourselves accountable and the patients accountable and not allow some of these things to happen that I guess are, would be shortcuts or allow for um, more transmissions of the, of the disease. Another big thing this year has been wearing a mask. Uh, I think a lot of people have been doing good. Uh, seems a lot of people have been following the guidelines, wearing their mask in public, especially when they go into offices or or businesses. Some of the things that, that some of the masks that I've seen are the N95 respiratory mask, which which are probably some of the better ones to wear. And then you have cotton ma or cloth mask. As long as uh, you really the the object is is to cover the the nose and the mouth. Some things you don't want to do is leave that mask uh, under under your mouth. Uh, where you expose yourself. There's also, uh, we have face shields. So that could be a little bit more comfortable depending on, especially for for the workers, the dental team, we, we definitely need to have our face shields. But for patients, that could be a, a better option maybe than a mask. And we also need to make sure that we're covered up with a visor so that there's no holes, cracks, or anything like that around our face shield. Next, we have the cough and sneeze cover up. Now, why I did this is because I think before COVID-19, I think there was a big issue with how, what is the right thing to do in, when you're coughing and sneezing. A lot of people may not even have covered themselves up or they'll do one of these where, <clears throat> you know, they cough or sneeze into their hand and we can't, we can't really be having that now. I know some people, they, which is, this is better than doing it in the hand. They do the armpit. I think I think the best thing probably would maybe do a cover like this, so you have that extra layer, and you're covering your whole mouth and nose, uh, and, and set up, and that that I think protects against the germs uh, better than some of the other methods. So our next biggest one is washing your hands. So I'm a, I'm a stickler on this. I really think this this goes a long way in in preventing uh, transmission, and. We'll, we'll go more in depth, but uh, some things that, that can help is, you know, the 20-second rule, washing your hands with soap, uh, water, 
and then try